Good morning. It is great to be back. If you are new to First Christian Church in the past month, then uh, in the lyrical words of a poet from my childhood, just let me introduce myself. My name is Matt. And I'm one of the pastors here, and every July I just take a break from preaching to read and to study and to spend time in prayer and reflection and spiritual recovery and to do some advanced planning for future sermons. I also take some time to vacation, to spend some time on our farm in Oklahoma, and it is just a privilege to rest and reset and get ready for another year of ministry. And I just want to say how thankful I am for our board of elders and our staff here who make it possible for me to be gone a month every year. And how about the past month of messages, conversations, as they were called. Didn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I mean, Jimmy, Marcus, Justin, and Sean do a great job. I am so thankful for them, and I am thankful for their stories, and I am thankful how how God used their testimonies to encourage us. And I'm already looking forward to whatever they come up with for next July. Amen? Well, today we are kicking off a new four-week sermon series called Roadblocks, and I have to confess what inspired this series is all the detours we have to take to get to church on Sunday morning. Anybody feel me? I mean, when they closed the 41 bridge for the summer, I was like, what? Like, we have hundreds of people who come from Cape Coral and North Fort Myers who worship with us, and they're closing the bridge for the entire summer. They're blocking one of the main thoroughfares to our church. Are you kidding me? And immediately it hurt our attendance, and I knew it would, at least for a few weeks. And it's just as we were getting into a new rhythm with the bridge closure, I'm driving home from work, and I see a new sign on McGregor Boulevard. And the sign says, beginning next Monday, McGregor will be closed for the next 12 weeks. And I was like, are you serious? Like, why wouldn't the powers that be wait until the bridge reopened? But then I was like, yeah, you know what, no big deal. I'm just going to take the on-ramp from McGregor on to Colonial, take Colonial to Cleveland, and then come to church. But would you believe the on-ramp from McGregor to Colonial was closed too? (laughs) And, And I don't know if you remember this, but for a good part of last year, Victoria Avenue was closed. And so in the past year, each of the three main roads onto our church property have been blocked for significant amounts of time. Now, listen. I have worshipped in Africa, in India, in other parts of the world where there are no padded pews and no air conditioning, no media, no technology. I've even worshipped in some Hindu villages where we were in danger simply for worshipping. And the truth is, regardless of our roadblocks, we got it good, right? First world problems. But you know what? I like my normal drive to church. Like, don't mess with my routine. A glass half full, I have discovered 22 new ways to church (laughs) through different neighborhoods this summer. (sighs) But all those literal roadblocks got me thinking about our spiritual roadblocks. Like, Like, what are the things that get in the way for us of a more consistent, more committed relationship with Christ and his church? I mean, why does the average churchgoer in America, not the average American, the average churchgoer in America attends church less than twice a month? What are the roadblocks to a deeper relationship with Christ and his church. You know, those who study such things say that a a church like ours that has about a thousand people in person on a given weekend actually has about 3,000 people who call that church home. And what that means is on any given Sunday, more of our people are not in church than are in church. And I bring that up not to judge, not to shame, not to chastise, 
but just to share an interesting reality. And and I don't think the people who are here every week are are better than the people who are not, or more righteous, or more holy, or better Christians than the people who are not. I just think we have roadblocks in our relationships with Christ and his church. And so a few weeks ago, I posed the following question. I put this on my social media. I asked the question, I said, what is keeping you from going deeper or being more committed or more connected to your faith and to your church? And that's the big question that we want to answer with this series. And there were, there were lots and lots of responses to my question, but easily the number one answer was busyness and overcommitment in other areas of life. In fact, Devin said, and I just borrowed her phrase, she said busyness and overcommitment. Erica said overcommitment with things like kids' activities and work. Clayton said busyness, tiredness, just not seeing church is that important. Kathy said, lack of emotional, physical, and spiritual rest. Leah said, working too much. And I think those answers are all part of the same conversation. And so we're, we're kicking off this series today by talking about busyness and distractions and overcommitments in other areas of life. And, and for our scripture today, I want to take you to Luke chapter 10. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is at the home of two sisters. Their names are Mary and Martha, and they have a brother, brother named Lazarus, whom Jesus would later raise from the dead after a bout of sickness. And, and these three siblings, they're actually very close friends of Jesus, and, and they lived in a town called Bethany, which was about two miles from Jerusalem. And one day, while Jesus and his disciples stopped to visit their home, a tense moment unfolded. And while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, carefully listening to his words, Martha was distracted. She was working frantically to prepare and serve a meal for our guests, for her guests. And in frustration, Mary, Martha scolded Jesus. She asked him whether he cared that her sister had left her to do all the work alone. And then she demanded Jesus order Mary to help her with the preparations. Let's just read the story together. It's a short story. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, I think there there are some parallels between Martha's mentality in this story and our own mindsets today. For instance, Martha's posture, don't know if you noticed, Martha's posture was one of distraction. Luke 10, 40 says she was distracted. Also, Martha felt like she had pressing work that had to be done that could not be delayed. Further, her eyes were fixed on other people's behavior, Mary, rather than Jesus. And finally, Martha's emotional state was one of worry and being upset. And so she missed an opportunity to connect more deeply with Jesus. And I just wonder this morning, how many of you can see a little bit of yourself in Martha's story. Distracted. There's always pressing work that needs to be done. A little too focused on everyone but Jesus. Worried and upset about so many things. Missing out on great opportunities to connect more deeply with Christ and his church. I want to take a closer look at these things that we see in Martha that if we are being honest, I think we find in ourselves as well. 
Why do we miss out on so many great opportunities to connect more deeply with Christ and his church? Well, the first reason is we're distracted. We are distracted. There are distractions. And distraction is when our attention is drawn away from one thing by another thing. It's a diversion or an interruption or an intrusion or an obstruction. The Greek word for distraction used in Luke 10.20 means to pull or to draw from around. And it's like things are circling around you that has a gravitational effect on you and your attention. And it's not like you even want to give them your attention, but it's like they pull you in and they drain you of your ability to focus on just one thing. It's like you don't choose the distraction. The distraction chooses you. And even though you want to get away from the distraction, like gravity, it pulls you down. It pulls you back in seemingly against your will. Right now I'm, I'm reading this great little book. This is called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day. Great book. And the point of this book is for uh, me to be able to build a rhythm in my life to make space to listen to God and to hear from God. And there's a morning session and there's an afternoon session and so there's two readings a day and, and you begin each session in complete silence for two minutes. You turn off any music, dim any lights, put down your phone, turn off social media. They ask for two minutes. Complete silence. And then there's a short section of scripture to read, and then there's a devotional thought to consider based on scripture. And, and then there's one question, just one, for you to ponder, to think about, to marinate on for a few more minutes. And, and then you just listen to see if God reveals some kind of answer to that question. And then there's a written prayer for you to pray. And then two more minutes of sitting in silence, listening for the quiet voice of God to speak. And you do this once in the morning and once in the evening, and it takes about 10 minutes each time. Now let me ask you something. Do you know how hard it is for me to get through even one 10 minute session in complete silence with marking off two minutes in the, two, in the beginning and the end? Like when I was writing these very words two weeks ago, I was writing this, writing about this very book that I'm reading, and I realized it was 1 p.m. and I still hadn't gotten around to the morning reading. And I had gotten up that morning and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the office and I brought the book with me. And I was like, the first thing I'm going to do is my morning devotional reading and then I'm going to work on my sermon. And I got to the office and I got distracted. First I started chatting with our staff, which I always enjoy doing. And then I was like, oh, i got to get to work. And so I started working on my sermon. And then a, a message went out on our staff channel that the teachers at our school, Connection Point, were back in the building. They were setting up for the new year. And so I went over to welcome them back from their summer breaks. And then on my way back to my office to do my devotional reading, another note goes out on our staff channel that says there pull, there's pulled pork for lunch in the break room. <laughs> And so, of course, I go to have lunch with our staff. And we eat for about an hour, and we're chatting. I'm like, man, I gotta, this day is getting away from me. I've got to get my sermon done. And so I, I go back to my office, and I sit down, and I start writing again, completely forgetting about my devotional reading. And I don't remember it again until I start writing this point about distractions. And so I stop writing, and I spend some time reading and reflecting and connecting with God, listening for his quiet voice in my highly distracted life. What distracts you from connecting more deeply with Christ and his church? Stuff at work, cellular phones, social media, TikTok videos, sports for your kids, Got to get the grocery shopped, got to get the bills paid, got to get dinner made. Luke 10, 40, Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. You might even say it like this, and this is number two. Uh, there's always work to be done. Anybody feel that? 
Like there's always work to be done. Uh, Growing up on a farm in Oklahoma, I know from lots of personal experience, there's always work to be done. When you live on a farm with cattle and horses and chickens and goats and all this stuff, the work never stops. You never finish the job ever. You never permanently complete a task. You just get up every day and you do it all over again. And then you try to knock out the less pressing stuff when you have extra time. But there's always work to be done. And of course, we now have all kinds of modern technologies to help us get our work done so that maybe once in a while we feel like we can get a break or have a day off or get a little rest and relaxation or maybe even a vacation. But you know, before all these technologies were developed, when the world was mostly agricultural and everything was based on that whole farm life, there was always work to be done. And that's the kind of culture, the historical context, the Bible was written in. It was a context where the work never stopped. You know, we say uh, work first and then rest when you're done, right? That's what we say. Well, it wasn't that because there was always work to be done. Your work was never done. And so God said to the Hebrew people living a nomadic and agricultural lifestyle, he said, since your work is never done, you have to take intentional time for God and for rest. And it was called Sabbath. And they had to take it because it didn't come naturally. And the thing is, and this is just an important thing to know about biblical interpretation, when the Bible tells you to do something, it's not because you're doing it already. If you're doing it already, you wouldn't need the Bible to tell you to do it. Like when I walk into my son Jake's room and I see that it's clean, and it always is. And then he keeps it clean without me telling him to keep it clean. I don't say, hey, Jake, you need to keep your room clean. Why? Because he's already doing it. See, over and over and over again in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, to be exact, it tells its readers to take a Sabbath's rest. And it's not because they were already doing it. It's because they weren't doing it. And they had to be reminded and reminded and reminded over and over again because there was always work to be done because they had to decide to pause their work and make time for worship, to make time to be with God, to make time to gather with community because it wasn't happening organically or naturally. Luke 10 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Why don't we connect more deeply with Christ in his church? Well, number one, there are distractions. Number two, there's always more work to be done. And number three, there's too much focus on other people's behavior. And we're not going to dive deeply into this one because I think this deserves a sermon all to itself. But when I posed the question a few weeks ago on social media about why people aren't more deeply connected to their church, one answer was hypocrisy. And it's just like there's this cynical view about the church that it's full of hypocrites and judgmental people and do we really need to be in church to be close to Jesus? Is our commitment to church really connected to our commitment to God? And again, I don't want to dive into this too much today because we're going to have a whole sermon on it later in this series, but please don't miss this. Martha missed the words of Jesus because she was focused on Mary's behavior. Let me say that again. Martha missed the words of Jesus because she was focused on someone else's behavior. One Sunday after, after church, just a couple of years ago, I saw someone post on Facebook that they were disappointed to see one of the teenage boys from our youth group wearing a hat in our worship service. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like that's your takeaway from church service today. Disappointment that a teenager 
was wearing a hat in church, really forget that it's just awesome to see teenage boys excited to go to church. And forget there's literally nothing wrong with wearing a hat in church. And forget about the fact that we just worship the God of the universe and preach the life-changing gospel of Jesus and remembered and celebrated his death, burial, and resurrection through communion. And your takeaway is you're disappointed. A teenage boy was wearing a hat in church. Come on, man. When you're focused at church is on how other people are behaving, you are going to miss the blessing every time of connecting more deeply with God and with his people. Don't let other people's behavior distract you from a deeper relationship with God. Let's see, what else was distracting Martha? Luke 10, 41 and 42. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus said Martha was worried and upset about too many things. (sighs) Doesn't that just describe you and me to a T? If you're taking notes, that's number four. We get worried about too many things. Too many things. Now, Martha, I don't know if you noticed, Martha wasn't doing bad things, right? She wasn't doing bad things. She, she was making dinner for Jesus and his disciples. I mean, it's Jesus. Guess who's coming to dinner? It's Jesus. Would that make you nervous? Wouldn't you want everything to be perfect? Like, don't burn the bread, and don't let the soup get cold, and make sure the lamb chops are done, and hopefully there's enough wine for everyone, and clean water to wash everyone's feet. It's got to be perfect. Martha wasn't choosing between good and bad. Martha was choosing between good and better. Making dinner for Jesus, good. Creating a great environment for guests to feel welcome, good. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him and learning from him better. Martha was worried and upset about many things, even if they were good things. But Mary chose what was better. Listen, it's, it's easy when you're busy and when you're overcommitted with so many different things in life, even the good things, it's easy to not have time for a deeper relationship with Jesus. But what you're often doing is you're choosing good over great. And that's what we often do. We choose good over great. And we know it. And as parents, I think we worry about it. Like, what what if I don't have my kids in the right sports or in the right schools or in the right church or connected to the right friends? Or what if I say no to that new opportunity? Will it ever come again? What if, what if, what if? Bottom line, we get to choose what's better. And being with Jesus, especially being with Jesus with your family and your friends, That's better. In fact, that's better than anything else. And so if you're like Martha, if you're distracted with preparations, busy with all the work that needs to be done, a little too worried about a few too many things, then be like Mary and choose what's better. Choose Jesus and his church every single time. It's the best choice you will ever make for yourself and for your people. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help us to choose what's better. In a world of distractions, busyness, overcommitment, help us to choose what's better. 
more deeply committed, more deeply connected relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. We pray in his name. Amen.